you've been handed a torch. You've been passed something along that generations and generations of Christians, in particular Baptists, have enjoyed. And they've passed it on to us. And I think God holds us accountable as stewards of some of these things. So I'd like to spend some time going in the Bible and looking at why we do certain things in the Bible. Why we have baptism the way we do and communion the way we do. Why we have the worship services here the way that we do. Why we believe what we believe. I think it's an important thing to do. I think it's a great thing to preach on. It's a great thing to have on CD for future reference. It's a wonderful thing to teach all of the the young children in our congregation, to let them know that there are very specific reasons why we do everything that we have in our church services. There are very specific ways that God intends for his church to be. And there were very specific ways in the New Testament times that God intended for his church to be. It's not good enough just to say when somebody asks you and they're critical of you and they say, why in the world do you do what you do? And you say, well, that just because that's the way we do it. It's not going to work. Um, if, if someone's a serious Bible student and they ask, why do you do it this way? And you say, just because that's the way we do it, that's not going to work. So we have to inform ourselves. We have to arm ourselves with the information to be able to defend what we believe. And obviously that's not so we can walk into another organization or another church body or another type of denomination and say, you're doing it wrong, we're right, you should change and be like us. We have no authority to do that. That's their group. But what we do want to have the ability to do is defend in all points what we believe. And we ought to be able to do that. God calls us to do that. The Apostle Peter said, be ready to give an answer for the hope that's within you. Be ready to give an answer. And the context of that chapter is persecutions. So be ready, even in persecutions, to give an answer of the hope that is within you. Be ready to tell people about what you believe. I'd like to spend some time talking about our heritage. Where did we come from? Did we just pop up in 1808? Was it just a group of people who read online? Well, they didn't have Internet back then, but or the newspaper of a book and said, oh, gee, Baptist, that sounds great. Let's just put a church here. Or is this something that came from another Baptist church, which came from another Baptist church as far back as we disappear into history and we trust by faith all the way to the time of Jesus Christ? Well, this is something that was passed along to us. We didn't just spontaneously generate out of the middle of nowhere. And as we'll see as we look today into the scriptures, that's the way church is intended to continue throughout the centuries. It's passed from generation to generation to generation in a certain way and Uh, We trust maintaining what Christ originally set up. The Bible is very particular on what God considers to be a New Testament church and what he does not consider to be a New Testament church. What I want to do is to present to you some things about the order of the church and the way God made the church. And simply as far as our interaction with that, all we want to do is that which we've seen and heard. We just want to do what God would have us to do because we believe that we should worship the way that Jesus set up the church. There are three things in particular that a church must have to be a New Testament church. Understand, in today's time, we live in an ecumenical climate. Is anyone familiar with that term? Ecumenism is the idea that anything with the term church is church. And it doesn't matter if it's a Catholic church, an Eastern Orthodox church, if it's a Pentecostal church, a Baptist church, a Methodist church, a Presbyterian church. It doesn't matter. As long as it says church, it's church. You know, Universalist, Unitarian church. It doesn't matter. Church is church is church. Well, that is a very new way of looking at Christianity. Our forefathers did not believe that everything church was church. And our opponents in generations past did not believe that everything that was called church was church. If you read Confessions of Faith of of, uh, Presbyterians and Lutherans and Catholics, all three, as a matter of fact, today I have uh, in my in my hand some quotes from some both, some of both, some a Presbyterian and a Catholic who talked about us as being a heretical sect of Christianity and a a, a thorn in their side for twelve hundred years. So they weren't ecumenical. We weren't ecumenical. But in today's time, the fad is to say anything church is church. Anything that says church doesn't matter what they believe, doesn't matter how they practice. It doesn't matter what they teach. It doesn't matter if they think God's word is inspired. Anything that says church is church. Now, it is not bigoted to say that is wrong. It is biblically, factually accurate to say that is wrong. Matthew chapter four. One of the things that is required for a church to be a church To be a church. What I'm talking about here is individual collective church bodies. Christ did not set up some sort of a centralized denomination. He set up a church and it's made up of sovereign, autonomous, localized bodies of believers. 
a church is a church. The church of the Lord Jesus Christ does not make up the entirety of a denomination just because they are that denomination. Whether a church or is or is not a church is based upon that individual location. All right. We could be a church and another one with the same name on, name on the sign may not be a church, according to Jesus Christ. They may have no candlestick. They may be dead. He wrote to one in Revelation. He says, thou hast a name that thou art living, but thou art dead. In other words, I've removed the candlestick. You're not really a church anymore. And eventually you're going to shrink down and just die. That's a sad thing. But that's reality. Christ is very particular about his church. And remember, it's Christ's church. He's the head of his church. And his interaction with individual churches is that of a parent. He says, as many as I love, I rebuke and chase and be zealous, therefore, and repent in Revelation chapter three. So he's, his dealings with us are individual from body to body level. And there are some things that are required for a church body to be a true church of Jesus Christ. Not everything that says church is church. Number one, I want to give you and I'm going to spend just a just a few minutes on this. I'm not going to give you this in depth today. I'm going to spend more time looking at the fact that the Bible teaches church succession and church perpetuity. Is that to be a true church, the church must possess the true gospel. Okay, the true gospel. Matthew chapter four, verse. Twenty three. Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Don't overlook that statement. Don't overlook that statement. Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom. Okay, the kingdom of God in the book of Matthew and in the New Testament writers, uh, the, the four gospels refers to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. Earlier in this chapter, Jesus began teaching in verse 17 and saying, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. People generally view that and say, well, that means eternal heaven, but it's not talking about eternal heaven. In the book of Second Thessalonians, he says, I don't want you to be moved by our epistle that that day is at hand, referring to the second coming. The second coming is not at hand. It's imminent, but it's not immediate. It's not at hand. But the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's something right here, right now that you can participate in and enjoy as you live on earth. Chapter five, four, verse 17. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. But this kingdom is identified by her gospel, the information which the kingdom is proclaiming. It is the gospel of the kingdom of God. Jesus went teaching in the synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom. Okay, turn with me to the book of Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Paul is writing to or speaking to the elders of the church at Ephesus, and he's charging them to be faithful in the truth. And he says in verse 24, but none of these things move me, referring to the afflictions that the Holy Ghost testifies he will receive in his future. None of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. Okay, put those two texts together. I want it to get a, I want the aha moment where the light bulb clicks on. The kingdom is... Defined by its gospel, the gospel of the kingdom. Well, what is that gospel of the kingdom? According to the Apostle Paul in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, it's the gospel, the good news of the grace of God. OK, so we have some more information here that defines for us, number one, the kingdom and number two, its gospel. The kingdom is defined by its gospel without the gospel. It's not the kingdom. And the gospel is defined as the grace of Jesus Christ. For an organization to be a true church, its gospel must be the salvation by the finished work of Jesus Christ by the grace of God. And if it's salvation by grace and or grace, but grace plus this grace plus that it's not the gospel. And so it's not the kingdom. It's such a severe thing that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Galatians. And here's where we get to the book of Galatians. And he wrote to them in chapter one, a very scathing rebuke. Now, by the way, this had infected the entire region. This is not just the church at Galatia, but the churches of Galatia. Chapter one, verse two, the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Grace be to you and peace from God, the father, from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God and the father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Verse six. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Okay, the gospel of the kingdom to to be the kingdom, it has to have the gospel and the gospel of the kingdom is the gospel of grace. 
And he writes to the Galatians, you have been removed from him that called you unto the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Look at verse seven, which is not another. In other words, it's not just another variation of the gospel. It's a false gospel. And because of this false gospel, this entire region is at risk, Galatia, of being destroyed as New Testament churches and becoming just Judaizers, just a a remade a uh, reproduced, remodeled form of the Old Testament worship service. He would write to them and tell them, this is not another, but there would be some that pervert or that trouble you who would pervert the gospel of Christ. It's a perverted gospel. Well, what is this? Well, he said it already. He said it. You've been removed in, uh, from the grace of Christ unto another gospel. If you read the book of Galatians, they had fallen into a belief that it took circumcision to go to heaven. And they said, well, we believe in salvation by grace plus circumcision. Well, the problem with that is it ceases to become salvation by grace. Then it becomes salvation by circumcision. All it takes is one law. If it's a law that says you have to jump over a broom and tap your head, it's salvation by jumping over a broom and tapping your head. I mean, whatever the law is, if you place one law, it becomes salvation by that law. It doesn't have to be a thousand laws. It doesn't have to be ten commandments. If it's one law that achieves salvation, then it ceases to become grace because grace is total unmerited favor. He says, you've been removed from the true gospel and you have succumbed to a false gospel. And I write to you to rescue from that. He says, though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which you have, we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. That word in Greek is anathema and it means religiously excommunicated. Turn him out of the church body. Do not let him. Now, it doesn't mean he can't come into the building, but he's not allowed to teach. He's not allowed to pray. He's not allowed to preach. He's not allowed to participate in communion. Place him outside of the collective church privileges. You don't let him in because he's dangerous and he's going to divide and take the flock away. This is a false teacher. But I want you to notice the kingdom's gospel is the gospel of grace. And if it's any gospel other than the gospel of grace, it's a false gospel to be the church through the ages. And, and when we look back, we're going to look back through his, history in a minute. You'll find our people have been believers in salvation by grace. As far as the church as a collective, visible, militant body here on earth. It has to be done a certain way. And if the gospel that other groups present are gospels of works. And according to Paul, it's not grace. And if it's not grace, it's not gospel. If it's not gospel, it can't be the kingdom. It can't be the church. So that would be a false gospel. The other two that are undeniable, they're non-negotiable, is the way the ordinances are done. And on our articles of faith and all of the old confessions of faith, whether they're the 1689, which is is confused as can be. If you read it, you're going to say it takes three or four men to believe all these things in here because they're contradictory. 1644 London's better. The 1655 Midland Confession is my favorite of any of the old Lond- uh, English confessions. It's the closest to primitive Baptist. You could put it beside our Articles of Faith and it would seem identical to it. Just about. It's, it's hardly any different. But they all agreed, as we agree, and as Baptists have always agreed until present time in, in most circles, that the ordinances have to be done the way God presented them to us for them to be authentic ordinances. Okay? This, by the way, is what God, our founding fathers, burned at the stake, sawed asunder, beheaded, crucified, all through the Dark Ages and all through post-Reformation Europe. Our people, because of this one thing, they didn't get mad at us because we believed in election. They got mad at us because of our requirements on the ordinances. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. Concerning baptism, it's always been believed by our people that it's by immersion as opposed to sprinkling. In the New Testament, it's undeniable that people baptized by immersion. They were completely immersed. This was always done by a God called minister. Now, there's a qualification why we we rebaptize folks. We baptize folks who come from us to us from other orders. There's nothing against them. There's not that we're better than them. But we believe we're charged with protecting the ordinance because our forefathers have done that to the death. We don't want to trample on their grave by saying, well, you know, it's not popular today. It's never been popular. Acts chapter 19, the Apostle Paul baptized people who had been baptized with the baptism of John by someone who was not authorized to do so. He baptized them again. What are you baptized unto? 
When he goes up to him, he says, he says, have you received the Holy Ghost? They say, we've not heard of any Holy Ghost. Well, then what were you baptized into? Remember that we're baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And he says, well, you need to be baptized. You've not had an authentic New Testament baptism. I believe that it's got to be the proper candidate, a believer. It's got to be in the proper mode, baptism. It's got to be done for the proper motive. That is the answer of a good conscience towards the Lord. But it's got to be done by the proper administrator. The fourth qualification is the administrator. It's got to be an authorized by the church elder, an ordained minister who has come under the imposition of the hands of a presbytery. The 1689 confession, the 1655, the 1644, they all talk about coming under the imposition of the hands of a presbytery. In other words, the ministers of the gospel lay their hands on him and ordain him. This is before the invention of seminaries. In today's time, it creates a problem because instead of being ordained, we have men who graduate from well-meaning men who love the Lord, graduate from seminaries and then proceed to do that work. Modern, very modern people even say as long as you have been baptized, you can baptize male or female. There was one person who was authorized to baptize in Jesus's day and Jesus walked several days journey to reach him. And his name was John. He was John the Baptist, John the baptizer. Jesus walked all the way to him. If anyone could baptize, any of John's converts could have baptized Jesus Christ. They walked all the way to John to receive that baptism. And John, he gets there. John says, wait a minute, you need to be the one baptizing me. He says, suffer this to be. Suffer this to be. The next one is the Lord's Supper. And we'll discuss these things in greater depth in the future. But in the New Testament church, it was, number one, people who were already baptized believers. Jesus preached to multitudes of people, but when he went to communion service, he went into an upper room with his disciples. And everyone that was there, were uh, they were all baptized people into the church. They were church members. They were disciples. He goes up there with his disciples and his disciples alone. He takes unleavened bread, you know, unleavened bread, bread without leaven, bread without yeast. And he takes the fruit of the vine, which we know because of Jewish tradition, because of the Passover, because of other things, that it was wine and not grape juice. The Passover was some months beforehand. They did not have Welch's. They did not have preservatives. They did not have MSG and all of those things that make food last an entirely long time. So guess what they had to do to preserve grape juice between the grape harvest and the Passover? They had to ferment it. And it became wine. And Jesus passes around the cup and he says, drink ye all of it. So the church has been defined. And we'll look at those things in in greater depth in the future. The church is defined by three major things initially. You have the gospel which she preaches, grace. You have baptism and you have the Lord's Supper. The gospel and the ordinances. If you look in the articles of faith, there's a lot of things of, of our church that are not mentioned. A lot of, I mean, they don't go into, to be a true church, you have to have the correct interpretation of the parable of the sower. No, those things were, all right, we'll discuss those. We'll work those things out. But what, those, what things are on those articles of faith out there in the, in the lobby? are things that we consider non-negotiable. And we feel, according to the scriptural mandate, what the apostles believed, what Jesus taught, is that to be a church, they must subscribe to those views and must practice in that way. Again, let me say, it's not that we're better than people who don't do it that way. We're not. We are sinners, saved by grace. But we do believe that the master has created a way that pleases him to worship. And he's created an organization called the church. And we want to do it the way Jesus did it. There are three historic views of the church. You have the view that is held by Catholics. I'm not knocking Catholics. You have the view that is held by Protestants. I'm not knocking Protestants. And you have the view that is held by Baptists. At least Baptists until the present time. Most Baptists today, because of seminaries, this all started with seminaries, because of seminaries being multi-denominational, Baptist teachers, most Baptist pastors do not subscribe to what I am about to present to you that I believe to be a biblical and the historic view held by our people. They don't believe those things anymore. I'm going to present to you some views on the Baptist view of history, and it's called church perpetuity. It is nicknamed in Christendom as church Baptist successionism. That's what other folks call it. We call it church perpetuity. I'm going to try to present to you that in light of the scriptures and show that Jesus taught church perpetuity. Jesus taught church successionism. And if an organization has been totally contrary to what Jesus presented as fundamentals of the faith, 
throughout history, it doesn't matter who they were or how long, if they had political power, if they had state power, they were not the church. And then it leaves us with the alternative. Unless Jesus was wrong in a verse, and I'm going to show you in Matthew 16, or Jesus was either wrong in what he said, that the church was going to continue to exist, or the church existed in some other form than that mainstream bulk of Christendom throughout just centuries. Three historic views. Catholic view and the Protestant view are the same until 1500. Why? Because that is when the Protestants split from the Catholics in the 1500s. It's the same view. Now, they may be more critical than, than Catholic encyclopedias, but it's the same view. You have the same lineage up until the 1500s in an event called the Protestant Reformation. And, you know, that's when Martin Luther and John Calvin and several others of the men who were fed up with what the Catholic Church had become sought to restore the Catholic Church back to what it was under the days of Augustine In the days of Augustine. They had no desire to create a new denomination. They had no desire to do that. They were reforming Protestant reformation. They were reforming, you know, the reform party in politics is one who goes in to change things back. We need some of that in politics, I think. But they were reforming the Catholic Church back to what it was. They weren't going in to make a new denomination. But nonetheless, because of that split within the Catholics, you have three views of history. The Catholics, the Protestants, and the Baptists. The Catholic view of history is the same as the Protestant before the 1500s. This is historically a fact. I'm not going to go into a lot of the history because I'm not here to preach history. I'm here to preach Jesus Christ and Him crucified and to tell you a little bit about His church. All right, the third view is the view that Baptists have, have historically held to. However, in today's time, because of seminaries, most Baptist teachers uh, cling to the Protestant view. Occasionally you find a Baptist teacher, a Baptist theologian, who does not. But most of the time they teach ecumenicalism. They teach that, well, anything church is church. Um, the Catholics held the church until the 1500s. The Protestants kept the church until then. And in the 1600s, the Baptists have had the church from then until now. And that is not right. It is not right. I'm going to show you with Scripture why it cannot be right. Allow me to say this in advance. We're going to look at some things in history, okay? But history itself is open to a multitude of interpretations. If, if you don't believe me, go pick up a, a Texas textbook and compare it to a California textbook. History is open to a, a barrage of interpretations. If you read a German textbook and an American textbook, you're going to get two different stories on World War II, Right? If you read a Japanese textbook and compare it to an American textbook from the 1960s, before the 1960s, you're going to get a much different version of World War II than you did, than you would a Japanese textbook today. Because there are two different sides. And, and obviously one side has a, a more accurate representation of history, but there are two different views. It's often said to the victor goes the spoils. Whoever owns the print press is who publishes the books, which, which is who records the history. A lot of the books that I get history from are out of print. They're not printed anymore. People don't like them. They don't want to hear it. It's bigoted, they say. And I'm not being bigoted about anything I present. I'm just trying to get you to understand this morning what God has blessed you with. Because if you don't know where you've been, you will not know where you're going. And all of the things that we do that we cling to tenaciously, well, what's the big deal about that? Why hold on to it? Why does it matter? Because we've been handed something that people have been burned at the stake for throughout centuries of Earth's history. For 2,000 years, a little bit under. All right. <clears throat> Jesus taught church perpetuity and church succession. This means that every church comes from a church. This means that our church got here because another church extended it an arm. People who were baptized into a Baptist church in Tennessee migrated down with an elder named John Nicholson, and they constituted a church in Killingsworth Cove in 1808, October 2nd. But there were already people who were baptized believers. And likewise, before that, wherever they had migrated from when they were in Tennessee, they were in the Elk River area, uh, the Elk River Association, where, wherever they were before that, you can mark my words, they were part of a Baptist group. And so the church is spread because Baptists believe in baptism. A baptized person and, a, and an ordained elder uh, extends and passes his torch on from generation to generation. They found churches and constitute churches. They baptize converts. They ordain converts that have been called to preach to the ministry. And then those newly ordained ministers baptize more folks. And it goes on and on and on and on. And so 2,000 years later, we have the church. And it's existed in the way that Jesus set it up. It did not get lost 
for 1300 years. I've got quotes that prove that not by us. I've got quotes from others that prove that. Matthew chapter four, verse 17, first verse we looked at from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The introduction of Mark's gospel says the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What we have in Matthew 417 is the foundation of the church of Jesus Christ. It is said in the book of Isaiah that there is one who comes before the Christ, who's who's. Who's the one who's going to be a a voice in the wilderness. He's John the Baptist and he's going to be making the way for the Lord's Messiah. He comes onto the scene. He paves the way. And here comes the Messiah constituting his church. The church was not constituted in Acts chapter two on the day of Pentecost. That's a popular view in Christianity today. All right. In in Acts chapter two is and the Lord added daily to the church such as should be saved. And that day there were added unto them three thousand souls. You can't add something to something that's not already there. They were added to the church. The church was in existence in the time of Jesus Christ. He says the kingdom is at hand. Repent. Turn from your sins. Confess me. You poor in spirit. You that are cast down. You that mourn. The meek. You that hunger and thirst after righteousness. The merciful. The pure in heart. The peacemakers. You which are persecuted for righteousness sake. Repent and join my church. By the way, that's the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5. Jesus begins preaching. Repent the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The church is there then. He set up and he established the church. Fast forward to the 16th chapter of the book of Matthew. He's talking about the fact that he is building his church and will build his church. Did you know he's still building his church today? He's still building his church today. It's not done yet. Well, how, how is he still building it today? Because you're still here and you weren't there then. And if you're here now and you weren't there then, then he's still building his church. Matthew chapter 16. Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi. He asked the disciples saying, whom do men say that I, the son of man, am? Who am I? Who do people say that I am? Well, that's a crucial question of Christianity. Um, As early as the first century, there were several groups of heretics that sprung up within Christianity saying Jesus is less than God. Jesus is just a prophet. He's really a specter form and he was a lesser deity to came and to come and make a way for you through knowledge to achieve communication with the higher deity. That was a a heresy Gnosticism. But whom do you say that I am? Whom do men say that I am? Some say thou art John the Baptist. By the way, this is a crucial point of the gospel of grace, the gospel of the kingdom. If if people do not believe that Jesus is God himself, then they cannot be the church. Does it mean that if they're wrong on points of doctrine concerning Christ's divinity, that they're somehow going to die and go to hell for that? But it means they're not the church. There's a difference. Within the entire elect body of Jesus Christ, out of every nation, kindred, and tongue, you have another body within of those who have been called into collective worship who make up the church. There are people who will be in heaven that were not in the church. Really? All right. There were three men hanging upon crosses on the hill of Golgotha. Two men railed on Jesus. At the end, one man is asking, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That man was not baptized. That man was not a member of a church. That man is in heaven today because Jesus said, Verily today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He was not a church member. He's in heaven today. He's part of the elect family. He's not a part of the smaller body, the remnant, the church. Matthew chapter 16. Some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Men say all kinds of things about you, Lord. They're, I heard a group over here saying you're John the Baptist. John the Baptist had been beheaded by this point. Other folks said you're, you're Elias. Now, there's a prophecy that Elias would come again. Jesus said that John came with the spirit and power of Elias. He was not Elias, Elijah reincarnated. But some say thou art Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, but, but whom say ye that I am? What's your opinion? Sign your name to this one. Let's see what you really think. And Peter speaks up. Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah. That means son of Jonah. For flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my father, which is in heaven. And I say unto thee that thou art Peter. And upon this rock will I build my church. Now, there's a comma there. He's not saying that Peter is the rock. The, the rock is thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. That knowledge is what his church has been built upon. Again, if that knowledge is not there, it's not church. Upon this rock will I build my church. I want you to know the next phrase. It's important. I want you to latch on to it. I want you to take it to your graves. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The fact that the church has existed in the way that Christ set it up all through history is not a matter of opinion. It's a matter of faith. 
Because Jesus said it would. And to say, well, it disappeared. And then in 1500, they got closer to it. And in 1600, these Baptists became popular and these Baptists sprung up. And now these Baptists are trying to do it again the way they did then, but it was lost for 1200 years. If that were true, Jesus would be wrong. I believe Jesus. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This means, as a matter of faith, That throughout the Dark Ages, when what was considered mainstream Christianity was merged with the state and enforced church growth by the edge of the sword. And if you didn't join, if you taught something they didn't like, sword. If you you didn't believe like they did, you were executed. That's true. That's history. Folks don't like to hear it. I'm not knocking the people who are a part of the organization today who did that 500 years ago. I'm not knocking them because they didn't do that. They can be no more held accountable for that than you and I can be held accountable for slavery. We didn't do that. We're not in that generation. It's not what we did. But that body did do that. But that body is usually attributed to the Roman Catholic Church as being the church throughout those centuries. But does that organization, as described fit the description of what we've read in our qualifications of the church, just in the three simple ones. Now, there are other ones like the merger of church and state. There are others like the enforcing of church growth by the sword. Jesus expects voluntary worship. Remember in 2 Corinthians chapter 9 about giving to the church, not of necessity, not of necessity. God loves the cheerful giver. God loves it when you voluntarily devote your life to serving him. If he had to force you to do it, it wouldn't bring him glory because he's your father and you're his child. And just like a a father is glorified more when their child obeys them because they love them is how God expects us to obey. And he's pleased when we do so. But church growth, the church was grown by spread of the sword. There are all kinds of other heinous things that were involved, things like indulgences, things where they would sell you the right to sin. Well, have all the sin you want. Just have at it. Do it. Have fun with it. And then just give us this money and it'll be okay. And you'll be all right. There are a lot of things that were contrary to something that excluded them from being the true church. So I say, well, that means that there had to be churches throughout the dark ages that were like we are today. But where were they? Why don't we know of them? Why aren't they there today? There are a lot of good reasons for this, but I'm going to continue proving the point to you that the church has existed from that time until now. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. This is the Great Commission. We know it. We love it. Jesus tells his ministers to go preach and baptize, and they command them to observe all that he has commanded them. Verse 19 of Matthew 28. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Now, don't, don't skip that part. We, we love to look at the verse before. Go ye and teach all nations. It's a fun thing to go and teach God's children about their beloved husband. That's a, that's a glorious thing. But listen to what they're supposed to teach. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Not anything different. Not, well, add a little bit of this to it and a little bit of that to it. And it's okay. We'll all just agree to disagree. We'll just have it right. No, whatever I have commanded, that's what you teach. Remember what John was told in the book of Revelation. Don't add anything to it. Don't take anything away from it. How often were the Jews criticized in Jesus's personal ministry for editing and altering the law of Moses to suit their needs over and over? What makes us think it's any different in the New Testament? It's not. Teach them everything I have commanded you. Things like baptism by immersion by an ordained elder. Things like unleavened bread and wine. Things like election, predestination, calling, justification, glorification. Things like that. And lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Well, Jesus only meant that for a little while. Even unto the end of the world. That seems like it's still relevant and in effect today, does it not? Absolutely. He expects us to command as ordained ministers of the gospel. He expects us to teach, to baptize, and to command them to observe all things he has commanded us unto the end of the world. That teaches church perpetuity and church succession. That the church is commissioned to teach nothing but what they have been taught. By the way, in Acts chapter 4, Peter says that. We cannot do but that which we have seen and heard. Ephesians chapter 3. The Apostle Paul says in verse 21. Of Ephesians chapter 3. Listen carefully to the language. Unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. 
What does that say? It says that there will be glory in the church and that the church will exist throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. It is undeniable that the Dark Ages did not represent first century Christianity. It does not. It takes it takes a novice understanding of what took place in the Dark Ages and compare it to what took place in the first century to understand that's not what Jesus set up. That's not the church. It was a pagan state that combined with a church and found power that way and used that religious slash political power um, for hundreds of years. And may would like to have that same power again today. We don't know. But the church will give glory to Christ throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. The ministry of this church. Yes, it is our goal to serve others. Yes, it is our goal to love one another. But I'm going to tell you the primary motive, the primary ministry, the primary mission, if you will, of this church is to bring glory to Christ World without end, amen. World without end. That's our goal as a church. And all of those other things are secondary issues, but Christ must have the glory. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 2. I'll read verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, that which you know I affirm, that which you know I teach, The same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. This verse teaches church succession and church perpetuity, particularly succession among the ministry. There were churches I've read about in history that came across the word but did not uh, refuse baptism because they knew they did not have an authorized baptizer until they communicated with mainstream Baptists. And that day was our forefathers of primitive Baptist, just normal, regular Baptist. They said, well... We don't have an authorized minister here, so we're not going to have baptism until we can find one and bring him in. Well, that's what this verse is teaching, that there is a perpetual existence, a passing of the torch, even among the ministry. It's easy to see it in the churches because our church from 1808, I want you to think about it. Ten percent of the church's history in the world, our church has been here. So if they say, well, how do you know what you believe is right? Well, 200 years of church history doesn't lie. And when they had established this church here, they believe what mainstream Baptists believe. And we've not changed. I was accused not too long ago. Well, you guys are a heretical cult that stemmed up in 1840. Really, our church was constituted in 1808. Did we go back in time? Think about it. We were before that and we haven't changed. That's why they started calling us primitive. We were like the way it was before we changed. No, we haven't changed. We're old school Baptists. Okay, is there historic evidence? For churches like we have today, existing throughout Europe, yeah, and th- those are easy to see. How about before the Reformation? Baptists existed before that Protestant Reformation. We are not a stem from that. We don't worship the way that they do. That's why we don't sprinkle. That's why Presbyterians and Lutherans do sprinkle. I'm not knocking either one of those. I'm not knocking the people that make those bodies up. I'm not talking about the people that make up our bodies. I'm talking about the order which he set it up. Because regardless of what I think or anyone else thinks, he set it up in a certain way. And it's obvious by the verses that I've just given you, the five verses I just gave you. He built this church. He set it up. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. It will be here throughout all ages to the end of the world, world without end. Amen. So it's here today. And it was here all through the centuries. All the way back to Jesus Christ. Can we see it? History is best viewed concerning our people with the mentality of looking for signposts as you drive down the road. We do not have massive libraries with the writings of Baptists in the 1400s, 1300s, 1200s, 1100s, thousands, all the way back. Why? Well, there were there was a period of time in Earth's history in Europe called the Dark Ages. It was called the Dark Ages because it was a very dark time when people that disagreed with the mainstream religion of the day were executed for what they believed. It was a pl- time of plague. It was a time of misery. It was a time of gloom and doom. And if you did not agree with the mainstream church, you were executed. What happened to all the Baptist writings in that time period? Burned. So you can't find them. So what you have to do is view it with the with the mentality of like you're traveling down a road 
And you travel so far and you see a signpost and you travel so far and see a signpost because it's a matter of faith. I prove that it exists because of this word. Instead of looking at history and saying, prove it to me with the history and then I'll believe it in the word. I'm going to prove it with the word and then try to find it throughout history. That's a biblical perspective to have because God's word is yea and amen. And if his word says that these old, simplistic, historic, grace believing Baptists existed throughout history because he said it would exist throughout history, then I believe it. Now, my task is to find evidence of it. Well, I've already given one great one. Um, you know, they say primitive Baptists didn't exist until 1840. Yet you sit in a church body that has existed since 1808. No, we're primitive Baptists. We got that name in the 1830s because we would not change. This church has been in the same way that it has. They meet different times and we have different buildings. But this church body has existed from 1808. Same articles of faith. So that takes us back to 1808. Back up to 1689. London Baptist. And their goofy confession. It's a signpost. It's not author. It's not inspired of God. It's not infallible. But it is a signpost. If you read what they believe, they 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 believe some things that contradicted themselves in, even in the same paragraph. But some things that they believe that we would amen. They believed in election. They believed in predestination. They believed in baptism by immersion. They believed in unleavened bread and wine for communion. They believed in. Ordaining ministry by the laying on the hands of the presbytery. They believed in um, in election, predestination and regeneration and the resurrection of the dead. They believe what we believe. Some of their points were wrong, but they believe what we believe. Back up a little further. 1655 Midlands Confession. Now, Midlands is in Mid Midland, England and Wales. The Midlands of England and Wales. These are Welsh Baptists. The 1689 and the 1644 confessions are London Baptists. London Baptists and Welsh Baptists are a little different. London Baptists are a little more geared towards um, the, the view of that day as held by some of the Presbyterians. And you can compare the London Confession to the Westminster Confession. Many sections are identical. But the Midlands Confession, were, it was held by Welsh Baptists. And if you looked at it, 1655. It is nearly identical to our articles of faith. Most of our churches, we believe, stemmed from the Welsh Baptists. Mike Ivey wrote a book many years ago about Welsh Baptists. Or we're descendants from Welsh Baptists. 1655 Midlands Confession. All right. We can prove that people that agreed with us who called themselves Baptists. By the way, the 1644 London Confession and the 1646 London Confession are identical, uh, basically. And the 1644 opens up with a statement to the churches that are called Anabaptist. It's often said by contemporary historians. See, Baptists say before we were Baptists, we were called Anabaptists. And before we were called Anabaptists, we were called Waldensians. And before we were called Waldensians, we were called Donatists and Montanists and Albigenses and all kinds of other things, Paulicians. And, and if you read a, a mainstream encyclopedia, these were all unconnected, um, anti-Catholic groups. They were radicals. They were heretics. They were rounded up and exterminated. Anabaptists included. It's said of Anabaptists that they have two descendants in modern America, according to contemporary historians. Anabaptists, they say, make up modern-day Mennonites and Amish, but they have no connection with Baptists. Well, the London Baptists, who it, we, can, we can see the church succession up until London and the London Confession of 1644 starts off with to the church is called Anabaptists. So our forefathers were called Anabaptists. I have two quotes I'm going to give you. We know through confessions and writings and books, by the way, a great one, a man named Samuel Richardson, he was one of the authors of the 16, one of the signers of the 1644 Confession, wrote a book in the 1640s called Justification by Christ Alone, Samuel Richardson. You can find it on the Internet. I encourage you to find it, print it out, and read it, because he believes what we believe. And he was just a Baptist from London. Now, some of his interpretation of texts are different, but he believed just like what we believe. That's why the title is Justification by Christ Alone. Another man of his day wrote the preface of that. And they're both well-respected men. They preached what we preach. And they were called in their days, falsely so-called Anabaptists. The word Anabaptist means rebaptizer, a rebaptizer. And they called us this because we did what with converts from the other religious affiliations? We rebaptized them, or in our opinion, we baptized them because there wasn't an authentic baptism to begin with. 
I'll give you two quotes. One is from a, a reformer. One is from the Zwingli, a co-laborer with John Calvin. The institution of the Anabaptist. Now, this is in the 1500s. The institution of the Anabaptist is no novelty, but for 1300 years has caused great, great trouble in the church. That's a nice signpost. In 1500, a Protestant reformer said the Anabaptists, not just random Anabaptists, but the institution of the Anabaptists. Listen to the language. An institution is an organized thing. This is not random. Like today's theologians say it was just random, unconnected Catholic opposition. No. The institution of the Anabaptists is no novelty, but for 1300 years has caused great trouble in the church. What church? Well, the Catholic church. We were a nuisance to them. We were trouble to them. We'll give you another one. Catholic Cardinal Hosius. President of the Council of Trent from 1545 to 1564. Were it not for the fact that Baptists have been grievously... What? That what were grievously tormented? Were it not for the fact that the Baptists have been grievously tormented and cut off with the knife during the past 1,200 years, they would swarm greater than all the Reformers. Wow. 1,200 years? Baptists existed for 1,200 years before 1545? Seems like if I do the math, that puts us existing in the 4th century as Baptists, doesn't it? Seems to me that that's about the time that the Catholic Church sprung up to start with, isn't it? Yeah. What this does is establish a line of churches. Though you don't have their minutes, you don't have their records, you don't have their names, and their names aren't important. But the fact that they existed remains. And it proves to, to me... What God's word taught all along, that the church would exist in perpetual, unbroken existence, passing the ordinances and the gospel of the kingdom all the way to the end of the world. It did not disappear. And it remains today. Were it not the fact for the fact that the Baptists have been grievously tormented and cut off with the knife during the past twelve hundred years, they would swarm in greater number than all the reformers. Now, this is a Catholic complaining about Baptists and reformers. The first quote was a reformer complaining about Baptists and Catholics. These little factions are not new, if you get my picture. If the truth of religion were to be judged by the readiness and boldness uh, of which a man of any sect shows in suffering, then the opinions and persuasions of no sect can be truer and surer than those of the Anabaptists. Since there have been none for the 1,200 past years that have been more generally punished or that have been more cheerfully and steadfastly undergone and have offered themselves to the most cruel sort of punishment than these people. What this guy just said, who was a president of the Council of Trent in the 1500s, is that there were men called Baptists, yea, Anabaptists, who existed throughout the Dark Ages, who practiced what you practice, who were rounded up and slaughtered for what you believe, and they could not get rid of them. I submit to you this morning that those are the people who pass the torch to us. We didn't disappear and reappear. We've existed since then.